Welcome to episode 18 of The Purpose Podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Maiden, and today we have Sylvester McNutt III in studio talking all about the purpose in freeing your energy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Purpose Podcast. This is episode 18. I'm your host, Nicole Maiden, and I'm so excited to have our guest who's here today in studio. This is not about PR. This is not about tactics. This is about real life conversations. Um, I have a guest here today who I for sure manifested this interview with. Um, it's Sylvester McNutt III. He is based here in Phoenix, but as most of you know, I moved here almost three years ago from Los Angeles. And I actually started following Sylvester uh, shortly after my divorce, which was almost five years ago, and didn't realize when I moved here that he was actually based here. So I was so excited to discover that he was here and I knew that we would connect at some point so I could really thank him for his words. I have been in media for years and worked in PR for years. I've been in front of a lot of writers, but there's something about his writing that for me, he he for sure has been one of the people who has helped me um, really do a lot of healing work. I have spent years working with professional healers and spiritual guides and, um, you know, meditating and all the things that we know that I do. Um, but there are certain people that I think their, their visions and their words pop into your life for certain reasons and certain times when you need them. And for me, Sylvester has been a huge part of my healing journey, which I know he probably doesn't even know, but I'm having him on today to really thank him and honor him. And I want to give him a chance to also share with you guys his beautiful journey, um, how he's gotten to this place of being an eight-time author, international speaker, and he's about to go on tour with the launch of his new book, Free Your Energy. So without further ado, Sylvester McNutt is here in studio. <laughs> thank you. That was an amazing intro. <laughs> feel like the podcast is over at this yeah, point. Yeah, that's we right. Go home. Well, we're just getting started. <laughs> I actually just want to share a little bit more about um, Sylvester from what I know, but I think it's important for everybody to know before we dive into letting him kind of share more of his personal story. But um, the first book came out in 2013. He also comes from corporate America went through um, a transitional time where he was not only taking a leap of bravery and courage to leave a job that wasn't serving him, leave a toxic relationship, also went through, of course, when it rains, it pours, as we know, and I know that's a phrase you've used, but um, also lost his father. The resonation of all of that for me is so powerful for anybody that's been following my journey over the last five years. It has just been one rolling thunder of a storm in so many ways. And I think that when you can connect with people that really understand how you're feeling and how you need to cope, um, it reminds us that we're not alone. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate the vulnerability and all the words that you've shared. Um, you've done so much. I I'm very curious to know because I don't know you as well as I'd like to personally as a friend, but I want to know what is that moment where you're sitting in that corporate job going, this is it. I have to get out of here and I have to start living my life for me. Yeah. So <clears throat> we probably need to go back before corporate. Let's um, do it. So I think th for me to start, obviously, my job title is I'm a speaker and a writer. So I think the really good question for me would be like, how did I start that? And I started that as a product of what I was experiencing when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so when I was a kid, my parents, they had a great relationship when I was first born. I'm the oldest of five. Okay. And so it was a really good, really good experience. And I remember we, you know, we would go to the beach, we would play cards. This is way before social media and like Netflix. Yep. So we were like genuinely interacting with each other. Sure. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Like I would fish with my dad. I would cook with my mom. I really had the first seven years of my life was really good. Then little sister came along and then some of the tension started going away mm -hmm. and the, um, the structure my parents had wasn't. I didn't feel like it was that good. Okay. And so I was aware of this as like an eight, eight year old. I didn't know what to call it, but I just, I could just feel it. I was just aware of it, that things were changing. Then brother came along when I was 10. Okay. Now I love my brother, but I think he was an accident. I think he was unplanned <laughs> because they weren't ready for him when he came. And so when he came, then like all that love I was getting at first was completely gone. It was mm. just, I was almost like a ghost in the house. 
And so uh, I started to notice the change in our in our interactions. And I would try to talk to my parents about it. I remember trying to talk to them like, hey, what's what's going on? Why are things different? Because, sure. you know, you're a little kid. So all little kids want the same thing. We want understanding or we want direction. That's it. Didn't really get the the open conversations I wanted from them. And so all of those emotions and thoughts just set on me. And what would happen is I would be in school and I would still be thinking about what was going on at home and I wouldn't be focusing on school. Mm -hmm. So my whole life, I'm an A student. I'm in honors classes my entire life up until seventh or eighth grade, because then I started having the the problems going on at home. And so I was in class one day and I just started writing about what I was experiencing in my journal. And the teacher was doing whatever she was doing. And I'm just sitting there writing kind of like your notebook right now. I just I would write front to back. I would never not waste the back page of the notebook. I would, I would I write, it. I think it's like 28 lines on the paper. I would use all 28. I would write in the margins everywhere. And so it kind of became like an obsessive thing for me to, to just write mm. my, op- my observations, my thoughts, my feelings. And then what happened is after about a year of doing that, then I started observing my parents through my writings. And I would observe they were getting arguments. They were getting fights. And I would just really sit back and look and I would ask myself, okay, if my dad would have said this differently, it would have been resolved. Or if my mom wouldn't have gotten that attitude, it wouldn't have escalated. And I would just really watch the interactions of their relationship. And so (laughs) what I would do is I would write solutions to the problems. Mm -hmm. And I was like seventh or eighth grade while I was doing this. And so that's when i realized now i wasn't really conscious of it it was like a subconscious thing but that's when i realized i wanted to be a writer Mm. so what ends up happening is my favorite artist growing up is tupac shakur he's my favorite my favorite musician and i thought he was a great writer (laughs) he was a great poet and he was a lot like me he was a very um like i feel like i was a well-spoken young kid but i feel like i was also very emotional Mm -hmm. and that's how that's why i connected to tupac because he was very emotional but like well-spoken and so you know, he, he always had this quote and he, he would just say, you know, I'm trying to do what I'm doing so I can make sure that there's some dirty ghetto kid who can grow up and be that rose that grew from the concrete. Yes. So as I'm as I'm going through my adversity and my problems in, in the home and I'm dealing with, like he said, like this dirty ghetto kid energy. I'm the whole time. I'm just thinking, like, you know what? I'm just going to be the rose that grew from the concrete. I'm going to I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to flourish. And I didn't know how. I didn't know really what that looked like, but what, what ends up happening, so that's like seventh or eighth grade, um, the drinking, the, the, my dad, my mom, they started drinking a lot. Mm. So my dad got a DUI, and my mom, it was a two-parent household, both parents working, and it, you know, that's like the best structure. You got both parents working, you got both yeah. parents spending time with the kids and yes. all of that. So it was like a really good structure. My dad gets a DUI, and so then it, it was almost like a, a butterfly effect of events. Sure. So the next thing that happens is my dad gets a DUI. Well, he makes more money than my mom. My dad was doing, he was a dietitian. He was like a managerial dietitian. And my mom um, was administrative assistant. So this is uh, in the 90s, early 2000s. Dad's making more money. Mom's not making as much. It makes more sense. This is what they decided for her to quit her job and then to kind of stay with the three kids now. Mm but then to drive him to work because there was no Ubers sure. at the time. Of course Taxi not. was super expensive yeah. and he had the DUI, yep. so he had to get to work. So this caused me to actually be more alone mm. because what would happen is they would get up in the mornings. This is post DUI now. They would get up in the mornings and mom, dad, brother, and sister would all go to take my dad to work. Mm-hmm. So now I'm by myself, so I, I had to figure out how to make myself breakfast, walk myself to school. They thought I was riding a bus, but I was walking to school. Yeah. So I would will, I will walk to school because I, I could be alone and just kind of think. I, re- I really love thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I would get to school. And at this point, eighth grade, I didn't care at all about school. I knew I was an A student because school was really easy. But I was getting C's and D's because I had so much like emotional trauma and stress on me from yes. the household not – flowing in a, in, a, in a healthy way. And so in eighth grade, I got this obsession with really two things. And it was trying to examine relationships to figure out how to, how to be effective in them. And then also how to use my thoughts and, and write. Yes. So, <laughs> so funny story. I know this, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a good question no, you asked I me. I love it. So what ends up happening in eighth grade is 
I write every day and I have a journal that I actually, I stole the journal. By the way, who wouldn't love to see those journals from eighth grade today? Do you still <laughs> have them? <laughs> so there, so I did a new journal every year. Yeah. Every year until I was like 23. But then when I was like 24, no, it was a year that my dad passed. I think I was 26. When he passed, I threw them all away. Mm. It was like a cleansing of yes. like that version of my life. Yes. But I mean, they, it they was, existed yeah, for a while. Yeah, they existed for a long time. <laughs> I love it. Um, so here's what happened. Eighth grade, you know, I auditioned for The Lion King. Yeah, The Lion King. And so, of course, you know, I auditioned. I'm a Virgo. I auditioned for the symbol role. I love it. Okay. I didn't get the role. <laughs> so then the whole thing was that all the eighth graders participated. Thank God you didn't get it because you wouldn't be sitting here, right? I didn't get the role. Okay. Some other kid got it. All right. He was a much better singer than me. Okay. And so <laughs> he got the role and all of the eighth graders... Um, all the eighth graders participated in this like play, this musical. Everyone had a role. And I was just super bitter because I didn't get the symbol role. Mm. So <laughs> I told myself that I was just going to write my own story because like Lion King, you know, is a story. Sure. So I said to myself, well, fine, I'm just going to write my own story because you guys don't want me to be Simba. Lion King is still my favorite Disney movie, right? The best. So I ended up writing this like Disney movie in eighth grade. And, um, when I wrote the story, then I realized I was like, wow, like I actually might be good at writing because I wrote a whole story. I wrote like a whole movie. So um, moving forward, when I get to high school, um, all the classes, are, they were horrible, like social studies, yeah. geography, algebra, like two plus X times Y. Like What? In there. What are we talking right? about? Algebra? What, yeah. What is like a foreign language? Yeah. But when I got to English and when I got to my speaking classes, yes. I was I was just like, okay. You were lit up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. A haiku? Okay. No problem. <laughs> okay. What'd you say? Okay. Boom. I, like I was doing everything. Yeah. I, I paid so, so much attention. I was just drawn mm. to writing and speaking. And so... When I was in high school, I, I, I was very fortunate. I went to a really nice high school. I went to Palatine High School, which they won um, Blue Ribbon Awards, which okay. gets awarded to the top 100 high schools in America. We won it three years in a row that I was there. So we were one of the top 100 high schools in America wow. for athletics and academics. So, I mean, I loved I loved the high school experience because it, it really gave me, like, a lot of culture, I felt like. Sure. Especially with the electives we got to take, they allowed us to pick. You could go the foreign language route. And they had like French, Portuguese, Spanish, all those. Or you could go the fine arts route. Mm. In fine arts, you had writing, you had art, you had photography, videography, wow. you had uh, speaking, you had theater. So I chose that route. Sure. So what I got to, I got to study, you know, the basic classes. But then I would have my electives. I would have art. I would have drawing. I would have writing. I would, I would have all of that stuff. Mm. And I just knew that I was drawn to the fine arts because I'm writing a movie in eighth grade. Yeah. And I'm amazing. writing, you know, journals. By the time I get to high school, I have two or three filled journals. There's 82 pages in a journal, and there's 28 lines, right? So it's like you got to think. I use front and back, and I use the margins, and they're filled. I have two or three of those. So at this point, I realize, like, man, this is like this is a hobby that I love. I love to do. Yes. So okay, I'm gonna end the story because I know you got more questions. So, oh, know, I have so I'm many. But this it, is so. such a good. I didn't actually know a lot of this, and I can almost bet that most of the viewers don't know a lot of this. So this is really you know, and powerful. I appreciate you for bringing me here because yeah. I've never actually really told my story. Aww. I've only just shared pieces of it through through my writing. So I, I, I finish with school to work, and then I let you take it over. So <laughs> from high school, I knew. When I left high school, I knew I wanted to be a writer and speaker professionally. Mm. Now, of course, I was playing football, so I thought I was going to make it to the NFL, and I thought I was going to do that first. I thought for sure that was going to be my thing, and I thought I was going to be a writer in terms of a sports journalist. I wanted mm. to be a sports journalist. I wanted to be a, a, oh, an so anchor. Oh, so see, it's so fitting you're on the yeah, show. Yeah, I wanted to be an anchor. Who knew? You know, uh, we had this channel back in Chicago called WGN. Okay. And I wanted to work for WGN okay. as a sports you know, sports anchor, talk about all the Chicago oh, sports. I love that. that was kind of like how I envisioned it. Sure. Still being a writer, still being a speaker. It's the same, same skill set. Same thing. Um, and so what ends up happening is I go to college, Northern Illinois University. I go to college. I'm playing football there, studying writing, studying speaking. Mm hmm. I play arena football for three years okay. after college. I'm skipping over the details because you, you may come back to it, but <laughs> I end up playing arena football for three years. Okay. Then. You're only making 
like 350 bucks a game. Okay. So when you're out of college, you're yeah. making 350 bucks a game. As an arena football player, that's not enough for you to sustain, you know, in, into the future. Sure. So, you know, you're 21, 22, that's fine. It's, yeah. You don't have much responsibilities. But in the future, and I'm trying to think in the future, I'm just saying to myself, no, I won't be able to play football forever. So I need to get back to what I was trying to do. That's right. Which oh. was, Isn't that interesting, though, how your soul was probably, like, pushing that message to you, but mm-hmm. you needed to wait for the right sign to hear it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so that is about how many years ago was that now? The, which part? W- uh, kind of putting when I left, the football. When I left football. So I left college in 09. Okay. So I'm sorry, 08. So basically 08 to 10 was the football era of okay. my life. And from 10 to 13 was my corporate America era. Yes. Yes. Which was, was that in Chicago? Still? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and what were you doing? So what type of work? it was actually, I started doing sales okay. um, in Chicago from 10 to 11. And then I got promoted to a, a manager role out here in Arizona. Oh, that's what, I was curious what brought you out here. Okay, so that if, you, was it. if you Google or the listeners yeah. Google, <laughs> word for word what I'm about to say, Blizzard, 2011 Chicago. Okay. The images that come up, and it's like a, a post-apocalyptic scene. Oh my gosh! Like it was so bad, people were leave or abandoning their cars, and just hopping out of their car because there was so much snow, so oh. much ice. Right. Me personally, I tried to go to work. I get to the door, I push the door, but the door wouldn't. It wouldn't open. So I'm like pushing the door to try to get out of my house, and when I can kind of get it open enough. I see the snow is to my nose. I mean, I'm five nine, so that means that <laughs> it was like five feet of snow, and I just looked at the snow and I said, "Okay, I'm done. I gotta go." Yeah, it's time for us to part so ways. So <laughs> as soon as that winter was done, yeah, the next spring, I was looking for the first ticket out of Chicago. Wow. Yeah, and that's how I ended up in Phoenix. So you came here through with this corporate job. With the corporate job. Yep. And. How long were you there before you left and then went into all the writing of the books? Okay. So when I was at the corporate job doing sales just as a rep, it was a perfect job. Yeah. I had the best. I had three managers that were great. Uh, it was uh, Andrew, Jeremy, and Jennifer. And they all had different styles. And what I liked about Jennifer is she was a very, like, laissez-faire manager. She was, she was like, okay, go ahead. Do your thing. Do let's, your thing. let's see how you do your job. I'm not going to micromanage you. Good. Let's see how you do your job. Mm-hmm. Jeremy was, uh, if you do your job, I'll reward you. And if you don't, I'm definitely going to talk to you about it. Okay. And Andrew was the, he was the, I want to be the manager, but I'm not sure of myself and I'm not sure where I'm at. Okay. So you're probably not going to listen to me very much <laughs> type of manager. And he was the type of, ma- he was the one I always challenged the most. Now I respected all of them. But I ch- actually, I challenged all of them. We, we all got into it. And I feel like that's healthy. It is healthy. It's healthy. You know, like it was respect. It wasn't, sure. it was never, you know, uh, it was always tactful. Sure. It was always appropriate for the corporate situation. But sure. I would always challenge them. And they would always challenge me. Mm-hmm. And because we had that dynamic, that's why I was successful sure. as a sales rep. I was top 1%, top earner in my company. Good for you. Ah. And so, so hold on. It. So here's what happens. Yes. So I'm top 1% as a sales rep. And yeah, because so, most people listening would think, why would he walk away from that, right? Yeah, so I'm top 1%. Right. Uh, my salary is really good, but then mm-hmm. I'm maxing out my commission. So I'm, I mean, like the commission checks, I'm making four or $5,000 commission checks. Wow. And on, on top, top of, of my salary. salary. Yeah. And I'm like 24 years old at the time. So that's, you know, that's rich. Good. That's rich, you it's, know, because you don't yes. have really responsibilities that's at right. 24 after college. That's right. And so... What ends up happening is that gets draining. Being being at the the bottom of the corporate ladder becomes draining when you know you have more potential. Yes. You know you have more to offer. You know you have more skill. It gets to be draining. Yeah. And I wanted I wanted more. I wanted I wanted more. I wanted to be a district manager. I wanted to be a regional director. I wanted to be one of the people in charge of the company's success. Yes. Um, and so what ends up happening is I get promoted to be a manager mm. in out here in Phoenix, forty uh, fourth in Arcadia. That's okay. where I, that's where I started. Okay. That was a, it was a retail location. So I get there and we, I mean, we were horrible. We were like, I think there's 64 in the region. There was like 64 stores in the region was, uh, it was Arizona, Nevada, SoCal and West Texas. Okay. Uh, oh, in New Mexico. Okay. So p- pretty big area of, big. of land. Yeah. And we had like 64 stores. We were ranked 
51st or 58th. We were really bad when I got there. Mm. But they brought in a new regime. They brought me. They brought a, a guy named Brian. He was from Minnesota. So, he, you know, he was a Minnesota Viking fan. I'm a Chicago Bears fan. So, you know, we had beef on Sundays. And then they brought totally in. Get it. They brought Probably in a, not a good time to tell you I'm from the East Coast. Who's your team? <laughs> the Yankees. The Yan- oh, the Yankees. Giants, yeah. The Yankees, that's, you yeah. know. But I'm going to Chicago next week for oh, yeah. a workshop, so. Oh, yeah. Chicago love. It's good weather right I now. get it. You got to go to a Cubs game. I mean, of course. You have to. <laughs> so they bring me in. They bring in Brian, and they bring in this other uh, guy. I won't say his name because yeah. I don't like him. Okay. So, yeah, we don't, we don't talk about him. We won't give we him like energy. Him. Yeah, exactly. I got no problem with him. Yeah. But I just, you know. Yeah. I don't like when people steal money from the safe. Oh, and, I don't like that. You know, stuff the place either. I work, you know, we need yeah. to we need to work with integrity. That's right. And when you're stealing money from the safe, it's kind of weird to me. Oh, but, but God saw that, trust me. <laughs> so what ends up <laughs> happening is we come in and we we just we just brought such a, a lively energy. And we just tried to empower our our reps because we yes. were the management team at this point. Yes. So we just tried to empower our reps. We tried to be there for them. We tried to a lot of times in management, there's a disconnect because your manager, they act like they're above you mm. or they have the, oh, I already did that. Like, oh, I was already top 1% sales. I can do this. Sure. I never took that role. I made sure I took my ego out of my management role. And I will always ask my reps, what do you need from me? What mm. can I do for you? Yes. You know, how do you want to be coached? How do you want to be taught? Yeah. Do you need me to show you how to do it? Do yes. you need me out here? Do you want me to? St- I would always ask, like, yeah. what, do you, what do you need? What do you need? And this goes back to what I was telling you about. Like, I was really obsessed with understanding relationships. Sure. So when I was in management, that's when I really got to practice a lot of what I, I was learning. Sure. Was understanding the relationships. So we go um, with this new staff, and we take the number three spot in the region, which essentially is the highest we can get because you have the Yuma store, which is the only store in Yuma. Like, in the Phoenix Metro, there's, like, 20 stores. So we can't be number one because there's so much competition. But you have uh, Des- or not Desert Ridge. It was Yuma, and then there was like one other spot, like Odessa, Texas, or something. Okay. And those two stores were number one and two on the rankings every month. So for us to get number three when we were just fifty eight or fifty one. Yeah, I mean, you were obviously doing great. Yeah, that's yeah. like a wow. Right. So why why leave? Okay. So here's what happened. So I do my sales. Right. I'm sales. I'm top one percent in the company. We're great. I get promoted. Now I'm in a management role. We're top 1% in our region. We're doing great. Yeah. I mean, even the director was coming in, and he's like, hey, what are you, what are you guys doing in here? When the, when the director of the region comes in and asks you, what are you guys doing because we want to mm-hmm. implement your best practice, that lets you know you're doing something right. Sure. So with that energy, I did my, my one-year time and title in my role. Yep. I'm successful. I'm yes. one of the top um, assistant managers in my role. Yep. My store manager gets fired for what I mentioned. Mm-hmm. So the, the the structure was two assistant managers, one store manager. Yes. So at that point, I'm thinking, okay, we've been successful. Maybe you're going to take one of the assistant managers, me or Brian, and put us as the like interim sure. store manager and give us an opportunity. Sure. Well, they didn't do that. Yeah. They brought in three other oh, people who there. weren't in the location. Yes. And what does new management do when they want to come in? They want to bring their energy to the situation. Oh, yeah. It changes everything. Well, the three of us came together and we literally changed the whole culture. Sure. So, honestly, the store manager didn't need to change the culture. They just needed to, to continue it. Sure. So, when we had we had three different people come in, our sales went down every every month. Oh, no doubt. We're yeah. back at the bottom again. Yeah, no doubt. We're bottom the 58. The morale was like crushed. Yeah. yeah, the morale was horrible. The reps yeah. hated. The, the rep, and the reps would come to, to me and Brian, and they're discussing how much they hate this manager. Yeah. Hate. If you hate your manager, you're not going to be good at your job. Oh, I mean, no. How many? I mean, I have been there. I have been there. This is my second bout as an entrepreneur, so I know what it's like to be in that corporate job. And then. Yeah take that energy to leave but what when, when is that day that you're sitting okay and I'm you go <laughs> i am done i'm getting to it. i had to build it up first so so here's what happens when i go to work every day and i'm basically babysitting people's emotions sure. which is what management is that's right and i'm trying to get the morale right yeah there there reaches a certain threshold where no amount of positive thinking or no amount of uh, of positive affirmations is going to reach an impact because the negativity is so deep because it's now toxic. That's right. And when you're in a toxic situation, positive affirmations are not going to help. 
That's What's going to help is Amen. changing the environment, changing Amen. the situation, removing certain people and changing the pieces that are in the environment. That's right. So that's what happened is I reached that point where it was no longer, OK, I can salvage this. I can save this where I was going to work. And I said, you know what? This is toxic. Oh, yeah. This is now bad for my health. This is now bad for my mental health because a job that I love so much that I didn't want to quit. Yeah. The job that I love so much is now a toxic source of energy for me. OK, well, at this point, and I talk about this in the Free Your Energy book, it's like, well, now I have to save myself. I tried to be there for everyone. I tried to be there for my company. Yes. I tried to be there for the reps. I yes. tried to have the managers back. Yes. Well, now I have to save Sylvester because this is toxic That's and it's right. killing me. And it's, it's literally killing me. Oh, I'm spending, yeah. as a manager, you're spending 45 oh. hours, 50 hours there. You got your phone on, your emails on. Yeah. You are connected. Yeah. If I'm going to be that invested into something, it needs to, one, be healthy, and it needs to give me back what I'm giving it. Of course, 100%. So what ends up happening is I'm going to work, and it took me like 10 days to realize, 10 consecutive days. Like, oh, man, this is toxic. Yeah. And I say, okay, well, I need to go. Mm. But nobody just quits their job because of how they feel. That I mean, that's actually kind of stupid to do. You need to, especially as an adult, you need to have a plan. And so that obsessive writing I told you about that I was doing in school, I was also doing that at work. But this time at work, what I was doing is I was I was taking five or six bathroom breaks a day, about 10, 15 minutes each, which you don't you don't need a bathroom break that long. Right. But I was going to the bathroom mm. and I was just sitting on the counter and I was writing my first book in my notes oh, on my iPhone. So good. So I was doing that every day. I was writing my first book while I was at work. Yeah. And the first one's called? Success is a Choice. Okay. It's called The Accelerated Success is a Choice. Yes. And that was about, what, 2014? We, was that, that, uh, or, I wrote it in 2012 and okay. released 2013. Okay. So when I released it in 2013, what ended up happening is just naturally having conversations with some of the customers at work. Sure. I started selling the book to customers at work. So my DM comes in and he, he gets wind of this and he asked me, like, hey, you know, you have a book or something? Said, yeah, 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 I got a book, yeah. You're selling it to customers? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, th they wanted to buy it. I'm a salesperson, so. Sure, why not? And he's like, well, you know, you, you can't you can't really, you know, yep. you, you can't really do that. And I'm like, yeah, I understand. <laughs> but it happened, so. It happened. When, when that happened, I kind of <laughs> told myself, okay, Sylvester, you're at a transition period, and you have to, you have to honor it. Like chapter nine in the book, the Free Your Energy book, is honor your energy. Ugh. And what I had to realize oh was I had to honor this this path, this subconscious path that chose me, and I had to choose it. Ugh. And so, so that's good. when I realized, when I started selling my book, and the DM was like, hey, you can't do that. I'm also not going to promote you. I'm going to bring other people in who... who yeah, you, you basically, the universe is like screaming signs at you. You've got people giving you money for your book and your words and your talent. You've got your manager telling you you're not getting promoted. God's like, go. Yeah. I know your energy. Literally. So yeah. when that happened, um, I just said, okay, well, I'm good at saving money. So I said, That's I, a I, good I, I saved up a bunch of money. Good. So, nope. There's one very important event that I, I forgot. So that was the first event. Okay. The second event, it was, um, you know, retail hours. You have to work Black Friday. You have to work Christmas, uh, New yeah. all that stuff. You're working all year. You miss all that all that yeah, family time stuff. Sure. And I'm a big family guy. I love my family. I know. Right? So what ends up happening is Thanksgiving, I, I fly back to Chicago. I spend time with my family on Chicago Thanksgiving, which yeah. is a Thursday. Okay. Friday, Black Friday, you have to work Black Friday in you retail. Have to. Yes. So I fly back at four in the morning from O'Hare Airport, the, bus oh. the busiest airport in America. On the busiest day. On the busiest day. And I'm just pissed the whole time. Of I'm upset. Like, I have to go to work. They of couldn't course. give me oh, this the off. energy. I can feel it. Oh, it's I was like, so right, angry. Right. Yeah. It's just like a rage. You get to work, <laughs> customers cursing me out. And, oh. You know, and it wasn't really me, it no, was just the energy that comes with Black Friday. Of course. Again, the, my mental health, suffering, suffering. So I said to myself, that's fine. I can work Black Friday because I understand the nature of the beast. Sure. You're working retail. You have to understand the environment you're in. This is part of the sacrifice. Sure. So I went to my, my DM. And as a manager, you have to go to the district manager for your schedule to get approved. We, we didn't have a store manager at this point. Mm. So it was just me and the other assistant manager. We went through three store managers. We didn't have a store manager, which should have been one of us. I would have been fine if it would have been Brian. Yeah. He would have been fine yeah, if it would have been I me. but can I tell you something and just yeah. listening to the story because I have actually never heard all this before? 
talk about a beautiful, I mean, you were being so blocked and protected from continuing on that journey and that mm-hmm. role. Look what's happened over the last five years. Yeah. I mean, what a blessing. Yeah, uh, in the moment, no, absolutely. not a blessing. I get in it. In the moment. Oh. In the moment, yeah. the world's crashing down. But I have been there. Like, look at what this has all brought you to. Mm-hmm. You would not have been doing all of this had you stayed in that seat. No, never. And here's what happened. Yeah. Here was the day that I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I went to my district manager because we didn't have a store manager. Sure. Which we should have. Yeah. So there's all this dysfunction. It's toxic. And I said, hey, I want to take the whole week off around Christmas because I want to go back. My my, my father is sick. Oh. And I want to yeah. go back and spend time with my dad because me and my dad didn't speak for about five or six years mm. um, while I was in college and right after. Because okay. we had, you know, some yeah. of the toxic uh, environment caught up with us. And I can tell you that story if you want to know. But yeah. What ends up happening is he says, no, I can't give you the week off. It's Christmas. Um, and actually, some of the other people you work with, they have kids. So it's going to be they're going to be the ones to get it off. Oof. And I said, well, I don't think that's fair. Oh, that so not fair. Kids can determine a schedule. I was like, actually, I think that's something I need to go talk to HR about. A hundred percent. Oh, well, you're not going to talk to HR about yeah, that. Right. I, I call the schedule. Oh, I call the shots. I said, well, you don't call the shots of my life. You call the shots of what I allow you to call, and I'm going to put my two-week notice in right now. Good for you. And I put my, no- I put my notice in right there. Yes. When, when it got to be to the point where I said I want to get off for family, and you tell me no, and then you're going to say other people are going to get off for family. Well, they're devaluing. Oh, oh such yeah, I'm such out. a lack of respect. Oh, I would have been out yeah. in two seconds. I put my two weeks Done. in right there. Good for you. He called me a couple of days later. He said, hey, you know, to be honest with you, you don't even have to do your full two weeks. You can you can just take it off. So you got to see your dad? No problem, of course. <gasps> I went back, and that was the last holiday that I got to spend with my dad oh. because he passed the following summer. Mm. So that was December 2013. He passed summer 14. Okay. I feel like I'm going to start crying. Everybody that listens knows I always start crying. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, wait. Well, I, we got to backtrack here yeah. because I lost my father last year also. Um, so what I'm hearing from the end of that story, which literally makes the hair on my arm stand up, is that by you giving your notice, mm-hmm. it freed you up to take the time to go see your dad. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I mean, wow. Wow. And you got to spend a couple of days yeah, with him? we got to spend time together. And see, it makes you smile. <laughs> I know. I know what the last time like was seeing my dad. Oof. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Wow. And so I think one of many things that I have t- – I mean, there's so much in that story. It's like my head spinning. I feel like we could talk for five hours. So you come back from seeing your father – Basically, everything now in you is all into Sylvester. Mm -hmm. Mental health, self-care, self-love, building a new life, writing the books, putting your vulnerability out there. You share all of this vulnerability on social media, which Mm -hmm. is how I found you. Mm -hmm. I didn't find you because of your books. I discovered your books through finding you on social media. Mm -hmm. What I love about your words, and I think what I was reaching for when I was coping with the trauma of my divorce and needing to step back and do work to understand my triggers, Mm -hmm. all these things that you don't grow up understanding. Like, Mm -hmm. right, I was going back to the little girl. Like, what was I triggered by as a child at home or through friends or anything? Um, The way that you write, though, so simply, Mm -hmm. but it's so on point. It's Mm -hmm. like I would read your posts and I would say, this guy is reading my mind. It's like <laughs> you're you're such a gift. I know you have hundreds of thousands of people following you. I know I'm not just speaking for myself. Like, thank, thank God that you got yourself out of that job. Mm. And thank God that you are doing this because this is truly what you're meant to be doing. And you know this. Thank this you. is your purpose. Thank you. One of them. Yeah. One of them. Yeah. One of many of them, <laughs> I'm sure. And I can only imagine what's ahead and I have so many people I need to connect you to. Like we're about Thank to open you. the floodgates for you, but Ooh. yeah. <laughs> and I'm a woman of my word. Anyone that knows me knows that, but this is such a powerful story. So your father passes away less than mm-hmm. a year after mm-hmm. you saw him. D- d- was that, so that was the last time you saw him when you went to Chicago that last time, or you saw him one more time before he passed? Was there one more visit? 
Well, you'd spoken, I'm sure, at mm. least on the phone. I don't recall, actually. I don't recall if the Christmas visit was the last, was the last time one. I saw him. But this is happening at the same yeah. time you're leaving the job. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, you were mm -hmm. releasing yourself from a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. It was like the, the perfect storm, right? Yeah. That relationship was interesting. So so I met the I met the girl um, while I was still doing sales in Chicago. And then I met her. My grandmother passed. My grandmother was my best friend. She mm -hmm. passed in Same. February 2011. Wow, there's so many parallels here. Okay. So in February uh 2011 then like the next month in march i met the girl and so um mm. i'm sorry not 2011 2012 i'm thinking 2012 okay and so then i met the girl and then the girl we dated for a couple of months so from march to september september is when i got promoted and i moved to arizona september 9th 2012 okay and so she didn't come she stayed back so we we did like long distance Ugh. so our relationship was great <laughs> the first six months yeah. and the long distance was great yeah but then around Christmas, you know, she lost her job. Mm. And she didn't she she was 28. She was older than me at the time. I think I was 26. She was 28 and she had no support. And like I said, I'm good at saving money. Yeah. You you give me $1,000, I'm only going to spend like 100. Yeah. And the rest I'm keeping cuz I'm just I'm very simple. I try to live a simple life. I love it. So, I just told her I said, "Hey, you know, you know, I know we've only been dating a short time, less than a year, and I don't I don't really want to live with you at all." But given the situation, you know, if you need to come crash here with me, just like let me know. Just think about it, and we can we can do that. You sure. know, get you back on your feet, get you a job in Arizona because she oh, she was talking heart. about moving yeah. moving to um, leaving Chicago as well, and so she did that. So you know, I brought her out here to Arizona, so she was staying with me for a while. Oh. Uh, yeah, well, one of the worst decisions of my life for sure. One of the best. One of the worst. Wow. <laughs> and it's so, okay. I yeah. was dealing with what I was dealing with at work, and then well, it's, like it's given you a lot of content to write about. Very, <laughs> very toxic relationship. So I had to get rid of both of those. Things. Yeah, but yeah. you know I, what I love about this story, and not that I want to see anybody. I mean, look, I <laughs> my I laugh about the last five years and all the things I've had to work through, and I'm still working through. I mm -hmm. you've been through a lot of the same, so I know you can relate. We go through our days, and mm -hmm. and you're never prepared mm -hmm. for. The relationship explosion, the work mm. explosion, the this person that's birthed you is now being taken from you and leaving yeah. the earth. All these things. And the reality is there's no guidebook. There's no one saying, here, Sylvester, here, Nicole, here, anybody listening, here's right. how you're going to get through this. We're left to have to work through so much. And when it's all happening at once, I mean, right. the depression is real. Yep. I people are so used to seeing me my whole life as this happy go lucky person. That mm -hmm. is my spirit. My right. spirit right. is the little girl in me that's still vibrant and happy all the yep. time and wanting to include everybody and just make the world a better place. But when you're going through dark, dark, dark times that are so real yeah. and so unprepared for and so unexpected, it is it, you just the dep the depression is so real. Absolutely. And so I I love though that Look, clearly you've been through, you had a couple of years of just one thing after the other. Yeah. But you also didn't sit and go, what was me? I'm going to play victim. Never. Right? Never. What I respect about you is you are somebody who has taken all of that energy from all of those things. Mm -hmm. The rage at work, the relationship, the mm -hmm. death, like there's so much. But you have put it out to actually help people through your healing mm -hmm. like you're healing yourself but you're helping so many people that is so beautiful and i love that you share it because as i was saying to the producer here before you sat down i think that one of the hardest things especially about grief whether it's you're grieving a relationship or the loss of anything is that you feel alone in the grief because not enough people i don't think are talking about it these are mm -hmm. very real emotions and to be in a relationship that is healthy in a partnership at mm -hmm. least for me i know that the relationship